Uh, my part of the course is uh, a course in the narrative and imagery of the English Bible. And to understand what I'm trying to do in the course, it might be worth uh, sketching in the background of the history of the course or why I started giving it in the first place. It goes back to my <clears throat> days as a junior instructor when I found myself saying to the head of my department of English here that I found some difficulty in getting my students to understand what was going on in Paradise Lost, which I was trying to teach, and that uh, the difficulty was obviously a lack of knowledge of the Bible. And my chairman said, well, how do you expect to teach Paradise Lost to people who don't know a Philistine from a Pharisee. And uh, I was tempted to answer that from the status that my students for the most part would occupy in society, that particular distinction would perhaps not be too important for them. But uh, I didn't often talk that way to my departmental chairman. And I said, well, what do I do? When he said, you offer a course in the English Bible. Well, <clears throat> in those days, religious knowledge was a college subject at Victoria and Trinity and St. Michael's. University College also had religious knowledge courses, but it had to give them euphemistic titles like Near Eastern Studies or Oriental Languages so that uh, Queen's Park would not be frightened into thinking that and a college with an interest in God was drawing money from the province. And uh, <clears throat> the courses, of course, differed a great deal. If you went to <clears throat> St. Michael's, you got St. Thomas Aquinas exclusively with perhaps a course or two in St. Augustine for dessert. And uh, so that the religion courses were rather enclosed in the various colleges. But when the University Department of Religion was organized, I could go on teaching the course within that department. But uh, then, under the new regulations, it became a half course. And as I think half courses are nothing but a nuisance for students, I uh, asked colleagues to to uh, give a course on classical mythology as well, and so to round out and expand the original idea of the course, which is to provide for students, whether their main interest was literature or not, some knowledge of the cultural traditions that we've all been brought up in and which we are all conditioned by at every time we draw breath, whether we realize it or not. It took me some time to hit on the right formula for a course in the Bible. I consulted the curricula of other universities and found that they gave courses called the Bible as Literature, which involved chopping pieces out of the Bible, like the book of Job and the parables of Jesus, and uh, saying, look, aren't they literary? And uh, <laughs> that approach violated all my instincts as a critic because those instincts told me that what the critic does when he's confronted with any verbal document whatever is to start at page one and the upper left hand corner and go on reading until he reaches the bottom right hand corner of the last page. But <clears throat> many people who have attempted to do that with the Bible have flaked out very quickly generally somewhere around the middle of Leviticus and part of the reason for that is that the Bible presents the appearance of being not a book, but a small library of books, a miscellany of, uh, of uh, various texts. And the suggestion is almost that there is <clears throat> no such book as the Bible. In fact, 
the word Bible itself comes from the Greek tabiblia, which is plural, the little books. And uh, so the, the possibility arises that the Bible, as we call it, is only a name we give for convenience to a <clears throat> pile of books that have just got bound up in one cover. So I had to go on to the next stage, which was <clears throat> to establish that there was a genuine unity in the Bible, and that that unity was of two kinds. The first was the unity of narrative. As I've said, not everybody gets through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but anybody who does will discover that the Bible at least does have a beginning and an end. It starts quite logically at the beginning of time with the creation. It ends quite logically at the end of time with the apocalypse. And it surveys the whole of human history, or the part of history it's interested in, in between under the symbolic names of Adam and Israel. And <clears throat> So the narrative unity of the Bible, which is there in spite of the miscellaneous nature of its content, was something that I stressed. And that concern for narrative seems to me to be distinctive of the Bible among other sacred books. In the Quran, for example, the revelations of Muhammad were gathered up after his death and arranged in order of length. And that suggests that the, that, that particular revelation in the Quran uh, pays no attention to narrative continuity. That's, that's not what it's interested in. The Bible is. And the fact that it is seems to be significant for the study of literature and for many other reasons. The second way in which the Bible is unified is through a number of recurring images. Images like mountain, sheep, river, hill, pasture, bride, bread, wine, and so on. They echo and re-echo all through the Bible, and they are repeated in so many ways as to suggest that they have a thematic importance, that they are actually building up some kind of interconnected unity. And the present course is really based on this conception of the unity of the narrative of the Bible and the unity formed by its recurrent and repeated imagery. <clears throat> The only form of the Bible that I can deal with is the Christian Bible with its Old Testament and New Testament, however polemically those names may sound. Uh, in the first place, it's the only version of the Bible I know anything about. And in the second place, it is the one that has been decisive for Western culture in the, through the Middle Ages and Renaissance to our own time. The <clears throat> Old Testament was, of course, written in Hebrew, except for a few passages in the later language, Aramaic, which replaced Hebrew as a spoken language and was probably the language spoken by Jesus and his disciples. And in Hebrew, the Consonants only are written down so that all the vowels are editorial and the establishing of the text of the Hebrew Bible took quite a long time. It was still going on in New Testament times. And <clears throat> some centuries before that, it had been translated into Greek for the benefit of Jews living in Alexandria in Egypt. And the number of translators was traditionally 70. And so that translation has been called the Septuagint. That is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It's usually abbreviated to LXX. And uh, 
the Hebrew text in the form in which we have it was established later. It's called the Masoretic text, the scholarly or traditional text uh, established by <coughs> rabbis and scholars <coughs> working mainly around <coughs> the environs of Lake Tiberias and in uh, Galilee. And so the Septuagint is in many respects older than the Hebrew text that we have and sometimes preserves more primitive readings. Then the New Testament was writ written in Greek by writers whose native language probably was not Greek for the most part and the kind of Greek written was called Koine, the popular Greek which was distributed all through the Near Eastern countries as a kind of, of common language. The writers of the New Testament may have been familiar in differing degrees with the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, but when they quoted from the Old Testament, they tended more to use the Septuagint. And that, as you see, is the beginning of a principle which is rather important for the history of Christianity. In any sacred book, there is enough concentration in the writing and enough attention paid to it by those who accept it as sacred for the linguistic characteristics of the original language to be of great importance. Any Jewish interpretation or commentary on the Hebrew Old Testament inevitably uh, takes great care to, to study the linguistic nuances of the Hebrew original. And similarly with the Quran, which is so bound up with the linguistic characteristics of Arabic that in practice the Arabic language has had to go everywhere that the Islamic religion has gone. In contrast, Christianity as a religion has been a religion dependent from the beginning on translation. And <clears throat> after the New Testament period, the center of power in the Western world shifted to Rome, and with that shift came the need for a Latin translation of the Bible, and the Latin translation that appeared was known as the Vulgate, that is the one in common use, and the translation was made by St. Jerome in what may well be the greatest effort of scholarship ever achieved by a single man. And for the next thousand years, the Vulgate Latin Bible was the Bible as far as Europe was concerned. There was very little knowledge of Greek or Hebrew through the Middle Ages, and the Vulgate was as far as they could go in reading the Bible for the most part. In already in the Middle Ages, the question of translation into the vernacular languages, the modern languages, had arisen. It <clears throat> was resisted by authorities of the church establishment, partly out of reaction and partly uh, because the issue very soon got involved with reform movements within the church. One of these reform movements was led in England by John Wycliffe, The name has been spelt in something like 30 different ways, but that's one way. And uh, <clears throat> he was a contemporary of Chaucer in the 14th century. And his disciples, working mainly after his death, produced an English translation of the entire Bible, which was, of course, a translation of the Vulgate Latin text, not of the Greek and Hebrew. Nevertheless, the Wycliffeite Bible 
became the basis for all the future English translations. <clears throat> in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation broke out in Germany under Luther, and one of the major efforts that Luther made to consolidate his position was <clears throat> to have a complete translation of the Bible made into German, which uh, was, among other things, a cornerstone of modern German literature. And similar efforts were made in England. <clears throat> Henry VIII, you remember, declared himself to be the head of the church, but didn't want to make any alteration in uh, church doctrine. So he amused himself in his later years by executing Protestants for heresy and Catholics for denying his headship of the church. And, uh, <clears throat> and so the person who worked on the translation of the Bible into English from Greek and Hebrew sources, the first translation to be made, was named William Tyndall, <clears throat> who was a refugee and had to work on the continent. And eventually he was caught by Henry's goon squad and uh, transported back to England, where he was burned at the stake along with copies of his, of his Bible. However, <clears throat> uh, Henry VIII, with that versatility of, uh, of intention, which is often found in people who have tertiary syphilis, uh, <laughs> had begun his reign by being called defender of the faith by the Pope because he had uh, written a pamphlet attacking Martin Luther. That is to say, his minister, Sir Thomas More, had written it, but Henry had signed it. And uh, as defender of the faith, he had changed his mind about what faith he was going to defend. And in the last years of his reign, the English Bible in in various other translators' hands, Miles Coverdell and others, have become established as <clears throat> the official Bible for the Church of England, of which he was the head. Well, in Queen Elizabeth's reign, there were two Bibles. One was very largely the product of the right-wing establishment in the Church of England, it was called the Bishop's Bible, and the other was a Puritan Bible, which had been produced again by refugees on the continent working through Queen Mary's reign. It was called the Geneva Bible, and uh, it is sometimes called the Breaches Bible, because in the story of the fall of Adam and Eve, it is said that after the fall, they knew that they were naked, and so they tried to make for themselves what the King James Bible refers to chastely as aprons. But the Puritan Bible says breeches, and that was how it, it got to be called that. In Elizabeth's reign, the Bishop's Bible was the one that was approved of. The Geneva Bible was not approved. The objections against it were less to its scholarship, which was very thorough, than to its marginal notes, which were very copious, and which set out the infallible rightness of the Puritan position and the madness and the obstinacy of everyone who opposed it. But they both circulated in England, and Shakespeare is believed by scholars to have used a Bishop's Bible for his earlier plays and a Geneva Bible for his later ones, <clears throat> almost certainly by pure accident. Elizabeth died in 1603, and, his, and her successor, King James VI of Scotland, moved to London to become King James I of England. King James was the son of Mary Queen of Scots, who was, of course, Roman Catholic, <clears throat> 
He had listened to a lot of Puritan sermons in his youth, and this had conditioned him in favor of the more right-wing establishment. In fact, no bishop, no king was one of his mottos. He believed that, that the Episcopal system was essential to the monarchy. However, his real motto was Blessed are the Peacemakers, and he thought that he would try to achieve some kind of reconciliation between the Episcopalian right wing of the Church of England and the Puritan left wing, because at that time the Puritans did not form a separate church, but were a group within the Church of England. <clears throat> His way of achieving reconciliation was the time-honored way of calling a conference, which met at Hampton Court in 1604, and after a few weeks it broke up with the usual theological hair pulling, but uh, <clears throat> before it did so, it had passed one very important resolution, which was that there should be an authorized English translation of the Bible to be done by a committee of scholars who would represent both Episcopalian and Puritan scholarship. And they worked on their translation for seven years, and finally the <clears throat> translation appeared in 1611 and was known as the Authorized Version because it was, as the title page says, appointed to be read in churches. It is also often called the King James Bible, and please do not refer to it as the St. James Bible. Uh, <clears throat> King James was a remarkable person in many ways. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a poet, he was a literary critic, he was a diplomat, he was an anti-tobacco pamphleteer, he was strongly homosexual and was in all probability a bastard, but he was not a saint. And, uh, <clears throat> and the authorized version held the field and nobody else attempted another version of the Bible except the Roman Catholics who again had to be working on the continent in uh, outside the country. They had previously done a translation of the New Testament <clears throat> early in Elizabeth's reign. They, uh, they translated the complete Bible of the Old Testament and it's known as the Douay Bible because it was completed at Douay in France and it was completed in 1609 uh, which is a little late for the translators of the 1611 Bible to make much use of it. In contrast to the King James Bible, <clears throat> the Douay Bible is based on the Vulgate, which the Roman Catholic Con Council of Trent in the 16th century had declared to be the authentic version of the Bible, and it had stipulated that any Catholic translation of the Bible into English would have to follow the Vulgate original. The sequence of English Bibles culminating in the King James Bible <coughs> go back to the Wycliffe Bible, which again was a translation from the Vulgate. And after 1611, scholars like Milton or Sir Thomas Brown usually continued to quote the Vulgate in Latin, but uh, the use of the English Bible naturally grew as the language grew. The <clears throat> King James Bible is the one that I want to use for this course. I have various reasons for that. It is the most familiar and the most accessible version, and more important, the translators <clears throat> of the Bible were not out to make a new translation, they were out to make a traditional one. 
There have always been two tendencies in biblical scholarship, though they've often converged. One tendency is the analytical tendency to try to establish what the original text says. And <clears throat> that is the critical tradition. The other is the attempt to translate the Bible in accordance with what a consensus of ecclesiastical authorities have declared the meaning to be. And <clears throat> most copies of the King James translation in ordinary circulation omit two very important things. And I would like you to procure, if you possibly can, a version of the Bible which contains them both, as this Cambridge edition that I have does. The two things that are usually omitted are, first of all, the book, the sequence of books known as the Apocrypha, which I will explain in a moment, and <clears throat> the other is the address to the reader with which the King James translators preface their book. The dedication to King James is almost invariably preserved in copies of the authorized version, but it's only a perfunctory piece of rhetoric, and the address to the reader is a very careful, very lucid, very honest statement of what the translators were trying to do and what their policy in translating was. And they say almost at once that they were trying to produce a version of the Bible that would be in general agreement with the whole tradition of biblical translation, rather than to make a brand new translation. Now what that means in practice is that the King James Bible is a Bible very close to the Vulgate tradition. Therefore, it comes very close to the Bible which everyone in England before 1611 was familiar with. And that is the main reason why I want to use it. <clears throat> The differences between Roman Catholic and Protestant translations of the Bible have been, I think, greatly exaggerated, and they are mainly confined to a number of technical terms having to do with the organization of the church. That is, the disputes turn on whether the word episkopos means bishop or apostle, whether the word ecclesia means church or congregation, and there are perhaps half a dozen words of that kind. We will not be concerned with words of that kind in this course. We are concerned with the imagery of the Bible, with words like mountain and river and sheep and, <coughs> and body and blood and so forth, words which are so concrete that no translator can possibly get them wrong. So there aren't any major difficulties in translation or variety of translation that we need to be worried about. The <clears throat> great prestige of the King James Bible in literature is largely due to the fact that it was an authorized version appointed to be read in churches. That is, its rhythm is based on the spoken word. And while there are a great many lapses, the ear of the King James translators for the spoken word was extremely acute. And it's because of that that the authorized version has held the field even against more scholarly modern translations. The, uh, 
the oral basis of the Bible, the fact that this translation was intended primarily to be read aloud, accounts for many of its features, such as the practice of printing every sentence as a separate paragraph, which makes sense in public reading. And the, <clears throat> the result is that the authorized version has established itself as a part of our oral heritage. That is, the sounds, the cadences of that translation keep echoing through our minds, whether we realize it or not. It was not until the latter part of the 19th century that <clears throat> the need for revised versions <clears throat> began to make itself felt. And even then, the prestige of the King James Bible rather overshadowed them. There was a British revised version in 1885 <clears throat> and an American revised version in 1900, and both of them from the literary point of view are flops and uh, <clears throat> made very limited headway, partly because the genuine scholars on the translating committee were always being outvoted by the old fuddy-duddies who were opposed to any change whatever, and more important, um, they fell foul of the principle of translating that is not the scholarly original, uh, not the scholarly knowledge of the original, that makes a translation permanent. It is sensitivity to one's own language, and these translators, in attempting a kind of middle course between the language of the early 17th century and the spoken language of 1885 or 1900, fell between the two stools. <clears throat> For example, there is a phrase which is repeated very frequently through the Old Testament, Yahweh Tzavioth, which in the King James Version is the Lord of Hosts. It's a magnificent phrase, and the American Revised Version renders this as Jehovah of Hosts. Now that is a mistranslation, even if it's more accurate than the King James Version. If you doubt that it's a mistranslation, just try it out on your eardrum. Jehovah of hosts reveals an extremely profound insensitivity to English as a spoken language. And no translation that makes a boner like that has any chance of surviving. Later on in the <clears throat> 20th century, you've got various other uh, translations the, uh, the Revised Standard Version of 1952 is one that I refer to a good deal myself. If you pick up the annotated version, which is annotated by uh, Bruce Metzger of Princeton for the Old Testament, I forget just who for the New, you get an extremely valuable book that has very unobtrusive comments and footnotes. And then the New English Bible, which is more British than, than the RSV, which is largely American scholarship, came out in 1970. And the leading Roman Catholic Bible at, the, um, at present is called the Jerusalem Bible. As I say, I would like to use the King James Bible for my own quotations, and <clears throat> I would like to feel free to refer to the Apocrypha as well, so it would be an advantage to have a Bible that includes that. The Apocrypha is a group of 14 books which were all written by Hebrews and almost certainly written in Hebrew originally. But the word apocrypha means hidden or concealed. That is the 
C-R-Y-P part of it, is from the same root as our word crypt, or cryptic, uh, things hidden away. And what was hidden in this case was the Hebrew original. And consequently, when the rabbinical scholars of the early Christian centuries were making up their canonical books, they excluded the books that had no Hebrew original. And uh, they survive only in Greek texts, or in one case, Latin ones, though in later years, archaeologists have recovered some of the Hebrew originals of part of the text. St. Jerome, when he made his Vulgate translation of the Bible into Latin, translated the books of the Apocrypha, but he put them in a separate section. The, the Church of Rome, however, overruled him on this point, and so Roman Catholic Bibles, even today, have the books of the Apocrypha along with the books of the, uh, of the Hebrew Old Testament. And the Apocrypha was also a part of the 1611 enterprise that was translated along with the Old and the New Testaments. But <clears throat> the Protestants tended to go back to St. Jerome's practice of keeping the apocryphal books separate. And as a result, they dropped out of most Protestant Bibles in, uh, in ordinary circulation. But in re reading earlier English literature, for example, you have to keep in mind the fact that the books of the Apocrypha were <clears throat> quite as familiar to readers in England as the books uh, of the Old and the New Testaments. For example, in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, which is an extremely biblical play, Shylock hails Portia as a Daniel come to judgment. Uh, meaning that she's a very good lawyer, but Daniel does not appear as a lawyer in the book of Daniel. He appears as a lawyer only in a couple of books in the Apocrypha, the story of Susanna and the story of Bell and the Dragon. <clears throat> Is there any question that far then? The books of the Old Testament, the books of the New Testament, and the 14 books of the Apocrypha make up what we ordinarily call the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of other books in the periphery of the Old and the New Testaments that didn't make either the Bible or the Apocrypha. And, uh, some of them have a good deal of interest in their own right. For example, there is a book, there is a collection of writings known as the pseudepigrapha, which is Greek for false writings, because they were ascribed to venerable figures who assuredly did not write them. It's true that a great many of the books in the Bible itself are pseudepigrapha in the same sense, but uh, <clears throat> that's another kind of question. These books are very largely prophecies about the end of the world. They were written in the last three centuries before the Christian era, and uh, they again are almost entirely Hebrew and Jewish in origin. The best known of them are two books uh, ascribed to the patriarch Enoch. Enoch is referred to in the book of Genesis as a great-grandfather of Noah, and uh, he is supposed to have written a long apocalyptic prophecy which was accepted in the early church as authentic. There is a reference to it in the New Testament, in that curious little epistle known as the Epistle of Jude, which is the second last book in the New Testament. 
uh, there is a quotation from the book of Enoch, and it speaks of its author as the seventh in descent from Adam, which he is according to the Genesis genealogies. But it very soon became clear that <clears throat> the Enoch of the Old Testament could not possibly have written this book, and so it fell out of favor, and it disappeared from Western Europe, and turned up again in Abyssinia around 1790 in an Ethiopian version. And there is a second book of Enoch, which turned up 30 or 40 years later than that in South Russia in an old Slavonic version. <clears throat> And there are various other books of the same kind in this collection. And some of them are classics in their own right, like the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs and, and the Sayings of the Fathers and others. But um, there is a man called R. H. Charles who has edited the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament in two volumes, and that's the version to refer to if you <coughs> want to know more about them. Then, around the New Testament, there are a number of writer, writings that didn't get into the New Testament canon. Some of them might very well have done so. There are two letters by Clement, uh, St. Clement, who was a, uh, a leader in the early church, and there are a few others of the same quality. But for the most part, there are a number of apocryphal writings that in the Middle Ages were accepted as very, log as very largely authentic, but which modern historical scholarship has rejected entirely as having any claim to, to uh, authenticity. But as long as they were accepted, they had an important cultural influence. For example, if you read Middle English, you will find there many references to the harrowing of hell, that Jesus after his death is supposed to have descended to hell and taken out of hell all the people who were destined for salvation, starting with Adam and Eve and ending with John the Baptist. And this is accepted as a part of the gospel in, for example, Chaucer, but it is entirely apocryphal. It goes back to a book called The Gospel of Nicodemus, or sometimes The Acts of Pilate, and it uh, is an interesting book, but it, as, a, as a gospel, it's a fraud. You can't accept it as having any historical basis at all. And <clears throat> then there are a number of infancy gospels which elaborate legends about the childhood of Christ. And uh, in one of them, for example, um, Jesus is out making mud pies and uh, one of his little pals comes along and uh, interferes with his play, so the infant Jesus strikes him dead. And uh, the dead child's mother comes to complain to the Virgin Mary, and Virgin Mary says to Jesus, now look, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't go around killing people like this. You know? it's, it's, uh, it's bad for public relations. And uh, so the infant Jesus says, oh, well, all right. And so he, <laughs> he goes back and brings the little boy back to life again and, <laughs> and goes on with his mud pies. In another part of the same book, he is represented as being somewhat bewildered that the other children didn't want to play with him. And, uh, <clears throat> and so they go prattling on and on with the inventiveness of second-rate minds. And uh, at the same time, it is those Gospels which assign an ancestry for the Virgin Mary and make her mother, for example, St. Anne. And St. Anne 
was the patron saint, I believe, of the province of Quebec. Uh, <clears throat> St. Anne de Beaupre is still a famous shrine there until it, uh, uh, until it was realized that there was no historical evidence for the existence of St. Anne, nothing in the Bible about her at all. And so the patron saint was transferred to St. John the Baptist. But that kind of, uh, of, uh, of nimbus, so to speak, does gather around the sacred writings. And they have been edited by a man named Montague James, who calls them the New Testament Apocrypha. Montague James was headmaster of Eton College and wrote some excellent ghost stories and uh, <clears throat> was also a classical scholar who edited these books. Then there are also two secular writers that I may be referring to quite frequently. One was a Jewish philosopher living in Alexandria in Egypt during the time of Jesus and known to posterity as Philo Judeus. And he was a Platonic philosopher who attempted to derive the doctrine of forms in Plato from the account of creation in Genesis. And while there's a good deal of straining to make interpretive points in his books, still they are also full of interest for anybody who is interested in the biblical pattern of imagery. And then there is a great Jewish historian, Josephus, who lived at the time of the Roman destruction of Judea and who wrote a book called Antiquities of the Jews, which uh, covers much the same ground as the Old Testament, but adds a great deal of detail in the later period. He is, for example, fascinated by King Herod, who turns up at the beginning of the New Testament, and a great deal of his book is devoted to Herod and his doings. And <clears throat> he has a later book called Wars of the Jews, which uh, deals with the final struggles against the Roman power. And he is, again, invaluable as a, as a uh, historical authority for the Old Testament period. Any question that far then? Yeah. Did the Gnostic Gospels be included among the classical Gospels? Did, did, uh, sorry, did. Um, we don't know much about the Gnostic Gospels because they survive only in the works of the Orthodox Christians who attacked them. And, of course, there were political reasons why their Orthodox opponents' books survived, or as the Gnostics' books themselves didn't. But they do quote fairly liberally from them. So you can learn a good deal about, about the Gnostics. The, the best introduction to Gnosticism is by Hans Jonas. It's called the Gnostic religion. And, uh, but there were pagan and Jewish Gnostics as well as Christian ones, and uh, <clears throat> it was a pretty widespread movement. I'll, uh, I'll be coming to the Gnostics later in this course and uh, deal with some of the issues they raised. <clears throat>